The internet has always been and will continue to be a place for connection for people all around the world. With social media platforms like Twitter and Reddit, it's easier than ever to communicate with people in any country. But since its inception, the internet has also been a very mysterious place. Whether it comes to the dark web, obscure websites, or even just unusual posts on various forums. The internet documents some of the strangest and most appalling events of all time, some of which remain mostly unknown. On Reddit, there's a popular format widely dubbed the Iceberg Chart that features a picture of an iceberg representing different levels of knowledge about any subject. The surface is supposed to hold common knowledge, but the further you go down, the more obscure the topics get. In this video, we'll talk about internet phenomena, lost media, and many other unusual events that have captivated the internet over time. On March 8, 2014, Malaysian Flight 370 took off the runway from Kuala Lumpur Airport and was headed for Beijing. The flight was in the air at 12.42 a.m. and was flying routinely across the Gulf of Thailand as it made its final verbal communication to air traffic control. Malaysian 370. Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120, decimal 9. Uh, good night. Uh, good night, Malaysian uh, 370. At 1.20 a.m., Around 40 minutes after takeoff, flight MH370 disappeared from radar screens at Kuala Lumpur Airport, before doing the same at Ho Chi Minh Airport, where they were supposed to contact air traffic control, but never did. More than 18 minutes later, air traffic control at Ho Chi Minh Airport contacted Kuala Lumpur to inform them that one of their planes had vanished. At 6.32 a.m., more than six hours after the plane had taken off, an emergency response finally occurred. It was later discovered that the plane had mysteriously deviated from its original route and turned west towards the Indian Ocean, where subsequent searches were located. Authorities and investigators used satellite information and debris drift analyses to reduce the search to a 25,000 km area in the southern Indian Ocean. More than 34 ships and 28 aircrafts from seven different countries were deployed to search the South China Sea in what was about to become the most expensive search in aviation history. Although the search was large, nothing had been found that would have given clues as to how the plane had vanished until almost one year later. In 2015, the right flapperon of flight MH370 was found on the opposite side of the Indian Ocean on a small island called Reunion. Subsequent searches near the area turned up more debris that was most likely from the plane. The plane had most definitely crashed, but no one knew why. Some theories have included a hijacking, as two of the passengers that boarded the plane had used fake passports, but it was later determined that they were only seeking asylum and had no intention to cause harm. Others have theorized that one of the plane's staff or pilots had taken control of the plane and intentionally crashed it. Leaked American documents had revealed that the pilot Captain Zahari had used a flight simulator in his home to simulate a similar route as the plane had taken right before it crashed. Although, as far as Captain Zahari's friends and family know, he hadn't had any problems during the months leading up to the plane's disappearance. He had no history of anxiety or depression and had showed no signs of social isolation or drug and alcohol abuse. After many subsequent searches and theories discussed online, what happened to flight MH370 and the reason it crashed remains undetermined. In 2014, just after the new year, Reddit user RedWantsBlue made a post to the subreddit r ghosts, where users can share their paranormal experiences with others. RedWantsBlue described in her post that she's been using an app called Sleep as Android, which records sounds as you sleep in your sleeping patterns. She claims that she only lives with her three-year-old child, who is scared of the dark, and that she sleeps with the fan on for white noise. But on December 30th, at 2.04 a.m., the app recorded something strange. In the recording, one or two voices can be heard saying short sentences, 
whether that be the woman's own voice or another voice, is unclear. In the background, a clicking noise can be heard, like a water bottle being crushed. Some claim that the sound is caused by the fan that was on, or the opening and closing of a bag. Another Reddit user, Blackwater Project, heard the audio, enhanced the voices, and then posted it to SoundCloud. Using this cleaned up recording, the audio can be interpreted in different ways. The woman who originally posted the audio clip claims that she hardly remembers being awake that night, but firmly believed that there was a second, deeper voice in the recordings. She was justified after a user recorded the frequencies of the voices. According to the Reddit user, the woman in the recording, in her sleep, says, which was around 265 hertz, while the unknown person who responded, was recorded at around 95 hertz. Many theories have surfaced since the original post, popular ones being a home invasion. Another popular theory is that the woman was talking to herself in her sleep, as some have pointed out that the two voices sound very similar. But since then, the woman has said that she's moved out of the house, and hasn't had any strange experiences since. In early February 1959, nine Russian hikers attempted to reach the summit of a mountain in the northern Ural Mountains, locally known as Dead Mountain. During their expedition, worsening weather conditions caused them to lose their original route and change directions towards the top of Kolatsiakl. When they realized they'd unknowingly deviated from the path, they decided to make a cut in the mountain slope to set up their camp for the night. Igor Dyatlov, a member of the group, had agreed to send a telegram to his sports club as soon as the group returned to Vizai, a small village where they were planning to go after the trip. He'd said that they should hear from him no later than February 12th. When the club hadn't heard from Dyatlov eight days past his given date, a rescue operation ensued. Rescue groups, the army, and the militia forces were involved in the search for the nine hikers. But the search revealed more questions than answers. Search and rescue groups found the hikers' damaged tent with a hole in the side, later determined to have been ripped open from the inside. The group's belongings, like shoes and jackets, had been left on the site, and there was no sign of the hikers themselves. Search groups eventually found nine sets of footprints, most leading to the edge of a nearby forest, around 1.5 kilometers away from the tent. Searching the forest, investigators found the remnants of a small fire, along with two of the hikers' bodies under a Siberian pine tree. The bodies were found severely underdressed, wearing nothing but underwear. Another three hikers were found between the tent and the tree, and were found in a position indicating that they were trying to get back to the tent. The remaining four hikers were found under three meters of snow at the bottom of a hill. They'd sustained severe injuries, including a fractured skull, multiple fractured ribs, and even missing tongues and eyeballs. Although four of the hikers had sustained life-threatening injuries, it was concluded that all of the hikers had ultimately died of hypothermia. Most had been underdressed for the severe weather, with signs that some clothing of those who had died first had been removed for use by others in the group. Since the discovery, hundreds of theories have been discussed. Avalanches, a fire, infrasound, and government cover-ups are among some of the most popular. But recently, with the help of the new realistic snow simulations from the team that created the movie Frozen, investigators were able to discover that snow slabs could have been formed when a strong layer of snow sat atop weaker layers, causing the surface to break off and potentially cause a dangerous avalanche that would have fallen on top of the sleeping hikers. This theory would explain why some of the hikers had broken ribs and skulls, injuries that aren't common with avalanche victims. The hikers would then have ripped the tent open and looked for other means of shelter, but with low visibility and severe weather, the hikers would have all died of hypothermia. Although, skeptics have voiced their suspicions on why the hikers would abandon their tent with little to no clothes on, theorizing that another force might have been in play for nine experienced hikers to die in this unusual situation. On 
On two occasions in 1987, the television broadcasts of two stations, WGN-TV and WTTW, were hijacked. The hijackers inserted a video of someone wearing a Max Headroom mask in front of a distorted metal line background. The first hijack lasted around 25 seconds and interrupted WGN-TV's 9pm news broadcast. It was eventually stopped after engineers at WGN switched their broadcast link to an alternative transmitter, at which point the news broadcast continued as scheduled. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild, so what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you once again about the 30 to 10 victory they had. Studio engineers assumed that the hijacking was an inside job, so they started searching around the building for the masked figure. It was later revealed that the video had been pre-recorded from an unknown location, but this television hijacking was oddly different from any others. Other television hijackings had occurred, but each of them had clear motives. Like in 1986, a signal hijack had interrupted a show on HBO with a message complaining about the channel's prices. Another signal hijack interrupted a show on the Playboy channel, showing Bible verses, which was later determined to have been carried out by the Christian Broadcasting Network. But the motive behind the Max Headroom hijack was unclear, as the video didn't have any sound. Although, that wasn't the last time the hijacking occurred. Later that same day, at around 11.15pm, another video interrupted Channel 11's airing of Doctor Who. But unlike the last one, this one had audio. It was later revealed that no engineers were on duty at the WWTW transmitter tower, so no one could have stopped the hijacked video. The incident itself was later nicknamed the Max Headroom Incident due to the mask that the unknown person was wearing. One suspect loosely speculated to have been behind the hijacking is Eric Fournier. Eric lived in Indiana, a few hours south of Chicago, and was part of a punk rock band in the Chicago region. Allegedly, the band he was part of had borrowed some equipment from a local TV station to record music videos, but instead decided to play their song over public television. Playing their song would undoubtedly put suspicion on the band so they allegedly decided to let Eric Fournier record a video and let it play on TV. Later, in the mid-1990s, Eric had created a fictional character named Shay St. John, who had the same mannerisms as the person who was in the hijacking video. Ah. Whoever was officially behind the hijacking remains a mystery. Before SpongeBob SquarePants' pilot episode aired on May 1st, 1999, it was originally named SpongeBoy Ahoy, with SpongeBob being named SpongeBoy. But because there was already a cleaning product of the same name, the title was scrapped and renamed to avoid copyright infringement. It's speculated that the original SpongeBoy Ahoy intro sequence is different from the official one aired on television. In the following years, a small number of photos and prototype sketches had surfaced on the internet, but for years, no one could find the original intro sequence used for the SpongeBoy pilot. But in 2009, the supposed original clip was uploaded by RetroJunk. And although the sequence is the original one, it was recorded after the name had been changed to SpongeBob. This sequence is the only thing that differs between the Spongeboy pilot and the official Spongebob pilot. Quantum immortality is a very strange and complicated topic, but very interesting once you start to understand it. The theory goes like this. 
Assuming that the many worlds interpretation is true, which is the idea that every possible outcome of every scenario is already realized in different worlds or universes, then we would be technically immortal. For example, let's say you're playing Russian roulette, and when you shoot the gun, there are two possibilities. You either get shot or you survive. But since you can't be aware that you died, your consciousness would continue into a world where you survived. This would mean that no matter how many times you shot the gun, your consciousness would continue in a world where you didn't get the chamber that was holding the bullet. This concept is summed up in this picture made by Jeremy Harris, a blog writer. On February 15th, 2013, multiple citizens reported seeing an object flying across the sky, followed by a vapor trail. They reported seeing the object generate a bright flash, followed by a small explosion, before the object went out of view. Many people caught the event on their dash cams and various security cameras. The explosion caused by the object damaged some 7,200 buildings in six regions across the object's flight path, as well as injuring around 1,500 people. It was quickly revealed by the Russian Federal Space Agency that the object was a meteor traveling at around 20 kilometers per second, entering the Earth's atmosphere. Subsequently, NASA estimated the size of the meteor was around 17 to 20 meters and weighed around 10,000 tons, around the same weight as the Eiffel Tower. Additionally, the shockwave that the meteor created registered on seismographs at a magnitude of 2.7 and was equivalent to around 440 kilotons of TNT. After the blast, office buildings had to be evacuated, schools were cancelled, and mobile phone networks were overloaded with calls. The meteor had been undetected until it had entered the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, there had been lots of cases where cosmic objects had gotten dangerously close to Earth without being detected. In 1983, a 9-kilometer-wide asteroid was discovered only two weeks before it flew closer to Earth than any asteroid in 200 years. And as recent as 2019, an asteroid was discovered only one day before it flew around 71,000 kilometers near the Earth. If it had been around 40 meters larger, it would have struck the Earth with the same power as the Tsar nuclear bomb. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebolt were two high schoolers who committed one of the deadliest school shootings in history at Columbine High School in 1999. However, in the days leading up to the event, the two teenagers recorded a four-hour-long series of tapes from their basement explaining their reasoning and methods, later nicknamed the Basement Tapes. <laughs> Around 2,000 select family members and journalists were invited to watch the tapes, which they later described to the media. It has since been announced that all of the tapes were destroyed in early 2011, and as far as the general public knows, none of the tapes have been released, except for a one-hour-long portion that have been uploaded to YouTube. These clips showed the boys performing small skits with a series of guns in between other videos of normal everyday activities of them at school and in town. However, a year before the massacre took place, Dylan and Eric made a video for an assignment in school. The assignment required them to create a fictional business and then advertise it. They invented a hitman for hire business and made the now infamous video promoting their fake services. God damn it. In June 2002, the Duyun International Photography Expo was taking place, an event where different photographers can showcase their work in a contest. The Photography Expo had recommended a certain place to take photographs, the Guizhou province, more specifically, Zhangbu. The area's mountainous and forested terrain made it a good place for taking photos. However, in the aftermath of the expo, a carving was found on the side of a rock that seemed to spell out a phrase using various characters from different variations of Chinese. However, reports of the rock and the characters are extremely contradicting. Some news and media outlets reported that the characters had naturally formed inside the rock before it fell and split in half, 
revealing the text. Some articles claim that it split over 500 years ago, and while others claim that it happened as recently as 2001. According to most articles on the topic, a team of geologists concluded that the characters had naturally formed around 60,000 years ago. The translation of the text is also disputed. The characters literally translate to Chinese communist death, but the widely accepted translation is Communist Party of China perishes. Although, many early reports of the discovery excluded the last character of the phrase, making it just Communist Party of China. And with the accompanying information that the phrase was naturally formed thousands of years ago, it became a large story in support for the Chinese Communist Party. But the story in the text is most likely a hoax, carved in by someone who was trying to express anti-communist sentiment, but whose efforts were ultimately twisted to support the Communist Party. The Communist Party of China wasn't formed until the early 1920s, meaning it couldn't have been made before then. And the phrase is supposed to be read from left to right, a feature that wouldn't be expected earlier than the 20th century. Although early reports of the carving removed the last character, tourists can still come see the complete carving, which still remains behind a glass window. In 2001, Nickelodeon announced a week named Jimmy Neutron Takes Over Nick, where, to promote the release of the Jimmy Neutron movie, the character would interrupt shows at random places and do something to disrupt the viewing. These interruptions included Jimmy Neutron changing the Nickelodeon watermark in some way, but in some instances, the show's audio would be switched out or distorted. You'll never go on those hooks again. I need a tailor. Most of the clips haven't been found, but some have surfaced on the internet and have subsequently been uploaded to YouTube. On September 20th, 1988, Tara Calico left her home to go on her daily bike ride near New Mexico State Road 47. Before she left, she told her mother to come get her if she hadn't returned home by noon because she was planning to play tennis with her boyfriend at 12.30. When Tara didn't return home by noon, her mother searched for her before eventually calling the police. Police searched the route Tara would typically use and found pieces of her Sony Walkman as well as cassette tapes along the road. After these discoveries, the case went silent for about a year until June 15, 1989 when someone discovered a Polaroid of an unidentified woman and a boy, seemingly bound and duct taped. The picture was found in the parking lot of a convenience store in Florida. The person who found the Polaroid later stated that she found it in a parking space where a white Toyota cargo van had previously been parked. Police still haven't found the car or identified the individual driving it. After releasing the photo to the public, Tara's mother, Patty Dowell, said that she was convinced that the woman in the picture was her daughter because of a scar on the woman's leg, identical to one that Tara had received in a car accident. Another woman claimed that she recognized the boy in the photo to be her son, Michael Henley, who went missing in April of 1988, but was subsequently disproved when authorities found Henley's remains in June of 1990. Analyses of the photo are contradictory. Scotland Yard concluded that Tara is the female in the picture, while Los Alamos National Laboratory disagrees, claiming that Tara is not in the picture at all. Some have even claimed that the Polaroid is a hoax, pointing to the unrealistic use of duct tape and the questionable placement of objects near the two kidnappees. In the following years, more photos surfaced, the first being in 2009, when a photo of a boy with black marker scribbled over his mouth was sent to Port St. Joe Police Department in Florida. Although the pictures made no reference to Terra Calico, authorities feel confident that they're connected in some way. A second picture surfaced in the following years of a female seemingly duct taped with the same blue fabric as the one seen in the Polaroid, but because of the vague nature of the picture, it can't be confirmed that the female is Tara. Finally, a third picture surfaced online of a man with a woman who seemingly bound and duct taped on a train, although this picture is widely considered to be a hoax. But with no recent developments in the case, the two people in the picture remain unidentified, and the case of Tara Calico remains unsolved. The Skyway Man is the name of a 1920s documentary film about stunt flights. It slowly gained popularity for its filming of spectacular stunts,
but its main source of fame was its uncut footage of a plane crash. On August 2nd, 1920, a stunt was being filmed for the documentary in which two pilots, Ormer Locklear and Milton Elliott, were supposed to simulate a plane crash. They used floodlights to guide the pilots and had flares on the wings of the plane to simulate the effect of fire. But after neglecting the advice to turn on the floodlights, the pilots misjudged how high they were and crashed the plane, killing Locklear and Elliot instantly. The crash was caught on tape and subsequently was put into the documentary, making it one of the earliest films to showcase a real on-screen death. However, efforts to find the original uncut version of the tape remains unsuccessful. In 1989, two German brothers, Ingo and Holger Bethke, decided to rescue their third brother from East Germany. They had previously escaped themselves, but their youngest brother, Egbert, remained in Germany. Their plan was to fly two ultralight planes over the Berlin Wall and retrieve Egbert from a predetermined hiding spot. So, at around 4 a.m. on May 25th, they started their flight, but one of the brothers had switched on a camera that was attached to the plane's wing. This camera recorded the entire escape. Parts of the tape have been released in documentaries, but the entire 16 minutes of footage has never been released to the public. I wish, I wish you would In the 1970s and 80s, The Dick Cavett Show was rising in popularity with its charismatic host and its famous interviewees like Muhammad Ali, Eddie Murphy, and John Lennon. It was a talk show style program with an occasional gag or skit with the interviewees. However, during the filming of an episode in June 1971, Dick Cavett was interviewing Jerome Rodell, author, editor, and founder of Rodell Inc. Rodell had been sitting next to another interviewee in front of a live audience when he slumped backwards and started making a snoring sound. But I hear... <laughs> And I hear the audience laugh, and I quickly mm -hmm. look to Rodale, and he's like uh, doing that. And um, I knew he was dead. I knew he was Dick Cavett, thinking Rodell was indicating that the conversation was boring, reportedly said, Are we boring you, Mr. Rodell? Though he later denied ever saying this. It was later determined that Jerome Rodell had suffered a heart attack on air in front of a live audience. The segment was not aired and was replaced with a rerun. Although as far as the public knows, the footage of Rodell's death has never been released publicly, and it's speculated that Dick Cavett is the only person still in possession of the tape. Although the internet has been home to many mysteries over the years, this video only provides a glimpse of the many strange and mysterious events that lie just under the surface.